Almost two years ago, I lost my cat, Gattino. He was very young, still a kitten, at seven months, barely an adolescent. He's probably dead, but I don't know for sure. For two weeks after he disappeared, people claimed to have seen him. And I believe two of them because Gattino was blind in one eye, and both people told me that when they'd caught him in their headlights, only one eye shone back. One guy who said he saw my cat trying to scavenge from a garbage can said that he'd looked really thin, like the runt of the litter. The pathetic words struck my heart. But I heard something besides the words, something in the coarse, vibrant tone of the man's voice that immediately made another accurate emotional picture of the cat. Back arched, face afraid but excited, brimming and ready before he jumped and ran tail defiant, tensile and crooked, afraid but ready, startled by a large male. That's how he would have been, even if he was weak with hunger. He had guts, this little cat. I spoke to my husband on the phone about taking Gettino home with us. I said I had fallen in love with the cat and that I was afraid that by exposing him to human love, I had awakened in him a love that was unnatural and perhaps too big for him. I was afraid that if I left him, he would suffer a loneliness that he never would have known had I not appeared in his yard. My husband said, oh no, <laughs> but in a bemused tone. I would understand if he'd said it in a harsher tone. Many people would consider my feelings neurotic, a projection onto an animal of my own loneliness and fear. Many people would consider it almost offensive to lavish such love on an animal when I have, by some standards, failed to love my fellow beings. For example, orphaned children who have no home, not one of whom I have adopted. But I have loved people. I have loved children. And it seems that what happened between me and the children I chose to love was a version of what I was afraid would happen to the kitten. Human love is grossly flawed, and even when it isn't, people routinely misunderstand it, reject it, use it, manipulate it. It's hard to protect a person you love from pain, because people often choose pain. I am a person who often chooses pain. An animal will never choose pain. An animal can receive love far more easily than even a very young human. Caesar and his sister Natalia are now 22 and 18 respectively. When we met them in 2002, they were six and 10. We met him first. We met them through the Fresh Air Fund an organization that brings poor urban children, nearly all of whom are black or Hispanic, up by bus to stay with country families, nearly all of whom are white. The Fresh Air Fund is an organization with an aura of uplift and hope, but its project is a difficult one that frankly reeks of pain. In addition to Caesar, we also hosted another little boy a seven-year-old named Ezekiel. Imagine that you are six or seven years old and that you were taken to a huge city bus terminal, herded onto buses with dozens of other kids, all of you with big name tags hung around your neck, driven for three hours to a completely foreign place and presented to total strangers with whom you are going to live for two weeks. Add that these total strangers, even if they are not rich, have materially more than you could ever dream of, that they are much bigger than you, and since you are staying at their house, you are supposed to obey them. Add to that that they are white as sheets. <laughs> Realize that even very young black children have often learned that white people are essentially the enemy. Wonder who in God's name thought this was a good idea. On the way back to New York on the train, Caesar asked me, do you like me? 
I said, Caesar, I don't just like you, I love you. He looked at me levelly and said, why? I thought for a long moment. I don't know why yet, I said. Sometimes you don't know why you love people, you just do. But one day I'll know why, and I'll tell you. <laughs>